You are listening to Franchise City, interviews with entrepreneurs. If you've ever wondered about starting a vending machine business and wondered whether the companies that are promising these easy paths to riches are legitimate, and if the vending business is really as simple as they say it is, well, you're about to learn the real deal about vending from someone who's actually done it, the pitfalls, growth tips, things to avoid. You're going to want to listen in today's video. We have Mr. Benjamin Barry on the line with us, and Ben has done what very few people are ever able to do, and that's build a very successful vending route from ground zero, one single location, to hundreds of locations. No fluff, no filler, just great advice from a successful entrepreneur. We're going to look at the different types of vending that Ben is involved with right now. We'll look at how he places his machines. We'll see how he got started, what type of vending is the most profitable for him. We'll look at whether buying an existing route makes sense, things to watch out for, as well as unique niche in this space that anyone can get started in vending with little to no money, and that is honor boxes. That's another market in which Ben has done very well. And please stay tuned until the very end. We're going to give you a link for a free download. Ben, welcome to the show. Great. Thank, thanks to be here, Robert. All right. So we get a lot of viewers asking about vending, and I think it's appealing to them because it's perceived as a relatively passive business, doesn't require a lot of work. Based on your experience, would you agree with that? Uh, in a word, no. <laughs> it's, <laughs> Not so. It's probably, yeah, it's, it's probably the opposite of that. I mean, a lot of people think vending is automated because the sales portion of it is automated. And that is true. The sales portion of it is automated, but there's a lot of preparation that goes around that in order to get to that point where you're vending something automatically to a customer. And, right. you know, then at the same time, you still have to service the machine, uh, which takes time. And, and probably on the whole, it's a lot easier and cheaper than, say, if you owned a convenience store and you were selling snacks. Yep. Um, you know, there's somebody that has to be there all the time that you have to pay hourly. But at the same time, you know, you you definitely have other issues with a, a vending machine. So I would say it's it's semi-automated, but it's not 100% automated. Right. Great points. Great points. Curious to know what uh, what got you into vending in the first place? Yeah. So I was looking for a new business. I had just finished my uh, previous ventures, which were in the online world, and. I was kind of at the point, uh, so so the um, first two ventures that I had, they were both websites. One was a blog. Um, the other was an e-commerce website. And once I finished with the e-commerce website, um, I actually had some experience with AdWords in that. And, you know, there were, there were definitely several mistakes I made. Um, for one thing, uh, I was selling a lot of the products um, off of Alibaba. Um, and mm -hmm. basically drop shipping those to other customers. And the main problem is that I had too many products on my website and also the value of the products on the website was too low. Right. So I was trying to get customers and I was using AdWords to get a lot of my customers. But um, AdWords, like the minimum cost per click is generally 20 cents. Um, and it's just very difficult to, to make money with that unless you have the right product, I think, for AdWords. Um, it definitely doesn't work for everything. So at that point, I, I was kind of tired of, you know, various online businesses um, and partly just because I didn't completely understand it. And I thought the cost of advertising was too high and that there was a lot of competition. So I was looking for something that had less competition. So I wanted to try something for the first time that was not online, um, something that I could localize so that it would be harder for everybody in the world to compete with me. And then I could just compete with people in my local area. So I was trying to think of like good brick and mortar type businesses, but something that wasn't um, 100% brick and mortar, meaning that like I, I wouldn't want something where um, I would have to pay like high rental fees or something like that. I wanted something that still had a low overhead but gave me some of those advantages of having a local business. So I was really just looking around, doing a lot of research. And uh, eventually I, I stumbled on, um, you know, this guy who was doing a lot of vending and he had 
started out, I think he was like a pizza delivery guy. And, you know, he just slowly built up his, his route in vending um, and eventually got to the point, you know, where he quit his job and he has a business now. So that's that's pretty much how I got into it. Great. And yeah, very important to be Amazon proof these days. And uh, you, you bring up some very, very valid points. What type of vending is it that you do? And are there any uh, different types that you found to be more successful than others? I do a lot of different kinds of vending. So I run down the list. Um, I do full line vending, which is basically your soda and snack machines. And then I do amusement vending. Um, which for me is mainly these uh, claw machines that have the, the plush or the candy and, you know, mainly kids use those machines. Yep. Um, so the other thing that I have is the bulk candy machines. So those will, will generally, from in my case, they'll be either one or two head machines. Uh, they'll have like, uh, like little small capsules with toys in them, or you can have gumballs. Um, that's generally what I do, but you can also have uh, different types of candy, Skittles, uh, M&Ms, stuff like that. And then uh, the last one that I do is honor box vending, which is a little bit lesser known, but that's basically honor system. You put snacks in there. Um, there's a little slot. It's like a little cardboard box. And then you can fit anywhere between like 25 to 75 snacks, depending on the size of the box. And then you bring those around to different locations and um, it basically just works the same as a, a snack machine, but it's on the honor system. Interesting. So those are the, the main types that I do. Interesting. And are there any that uh, are more profitable than others? Or uh, I mean, honor box versus claw machine versus candy versus soda. Uh, have you found better ROI in one than the other? Yeah. So if you just look at the, the cost of the product, that gives you a pretty good idea. So I'll do like a rundown of the cost of all the products. So for the snack machines, um, the ROI is not going to be quite as good as a soda machine. Mm. Um, and a lot of people, they want to get into snack machines. But um, And then there's another, there's another thing with snack machines is that there's also uh, expiration dates on a lot of those snacks especially for chips, um, that's right. not, they're probably only like a couple months. So you have to make sure that you sell through everything or else it doesn't matter, you know, if your ROI is good right. on, uh, on chips because you've lost half of your chips. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's a, that's a big thing with the snack vending. Um, so, you know, if you're thinking about getting into full line vending, I would say you want to try to start out in the, uh, the soda machines. And, and sell drinks because usually like with drinks, you're paying about 30 cents on the dollar for those drinks. Okay. Um, and that's, that's fairly reasonable, but with snacks, you may be paying more, especially for chocolate. So with, um, with chips, you're probably paying 30 cents on the dollar, but with, uh, something like, um, I don't know, like a Snickers bar or some, some kind of chocolate, you may be paying close to, 50 cents on the dollar and that's it's just very hard to make money if that's all you're selling right makes sense how big is your yep. route right now overall and how long did it take you to uh, to build that yeah so my route uh is about 150 locations wow and i located probably about 750 locations in order to get to that 150 oh. and that's that's another thing that a lot of people don't understand about vending is in fact this is probably the number one thing um that uh you know would make you successful in vending is the location is key right um, especially when you're talking about a machine because if you have a machine and you've spent money on this machine um, and it's in the wrong location and it's doing business then not only are you not making a lot of money, but you're not going to be able to pay off that machine, um, you know, in a reasonable time frame. So you need to make sure it's in a good location. Otherwise, there's an opportunity cost because you have this asset, which is the machine, and it needs to be in a location that, that deserves that machine. So if I have a location and they're not doing well enough, then unfortunately, you know, I have to either offer them, you know, one of my lower... Uh, products like maybe the honor box or you know i just have to pull the machine because it has to go somewhere that they're they're doing a lot more volume 
in order for me to be able to pay back the cost of the machine. So, so, you know, I will, I will take the expense of moving the machine and, and I'll, I'll locate the machine to, to a better place, hopefully. Um, but a lot of times, you know, you don't know until you get to the location, whether it's going to be good or bad. I mean, I've had locations that I thought, you know, there's no way this is going to do good. And it ends up doing great. And I've had the opposite too, where I, I thought, man, I'm, I'm going to kill it. And it, it didn't go anywhere. So you just really never know until you try. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. Is, is there any special sauce though? I mean, when you go to choose a location based on your experience now, is, is there, are there any guidelines that help you choose a better location over a bad location? There, there really are. Yeah. And, and, uh, what I said earlier was probably a little misleading. I don't go just anywhere with my machines. Mm. Um, and, and that's actually where some of the honor box business comes in um, because that's one thing that you can use it for. So, so these honor boxes that I have, um, you know, the actual box probably costs between like four and $5. And then the, most of the cost is the snacks that I fill it with. And like I said earlier, a lot of times the snacks are, um, you know, they're not going to be the most profitable form of vending, but the advantage of the honor boxes is, is that the cost of the machine is basically zero. Right. All you have to do is be selling these snacks. So a lot of times what I'll do these days is I'll bring an honor box into a location and I'll get them to take the honor box. And if the honor box is doing well, then I know that it's probably going to be at least a decent location for uh, snacks or for soda. Right. So then at that point, that's when I bring in the machine. Now you can't do that with every location because some are just too big. Um, they, uh, they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't be interested in any kind of honor box. Like you would have to put a machine there to begin with, but a lot of locations you can do that with, and it will help you find like some of those locations that, um, a lot of vendors that do the full line vending would have skipped over. But then you you can basically prove out that they're a good location because they're doing a lot of sales. Right. Makes sense. And are, are there any businesses that are better than others? I, I mean, office space versus manufacturing, anything that, that stands out as a great location? Anything where there's a waiting room with people waiting when, you, when you're when you there. Uh, so, you know, this, this can be misleading, too. So if you go somewhere and they have a waiting room that's kind of small. Right. doesn't mean it's a good location. There, there may never be anybody in that waiting room. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if, if, if you're seeing, like, at least a few people in there, then that means that, you know, constantly, all day, there's probably people in that waiting room. So, like, uh, a doctor's office, that mm -hmm. can be really good. The only thing about doctor's offices is a lot of times they don't want snacks because it's not healthy right. a lot of times. So, so you have to be very careful. You have to sell that in the right way. Or you might want to do like a customized uh, solution for them mm -hmm. with healthier stuff, especially a dentist office. Um, right. I, I never put stuff in dentist offices. Uh, yeah, it's just kind of counter to their message. But any, you know, uh, auto place, you can't go in every auto place, but one that has like a waiting room, like um, like a tire shop, that would probably be really good. Um, let's see what else. It, it really depends. I mean, if if you have like a blue collar manufacturing place, um, you know, there's a lot of hungry workers there. So as long as they have at least, say, like 15 employees, okay, um, I would say you're in, in really good shape there because a lot of times nearly all 15 of those employees will be regular customers. Whereas like if you're in an office environment, um, you're probably going to need a few more. Because the people working in that office, a lot of times, some of them will bring their own snacks, um, and some of them are just less um, less likely to buy your snacks in general. So you, you would want to see a few more employees if you had a location like that. And uh, I would assume one of the biggest challenges, is, and maybe uh, one of the most competitive, are those manufacturing type facilities. Uh, what are some of the biggest challenges that you faced, and is is competition one of those challenges? Competition definitely is one of those challenges. So it depends on what kind of vending that you're into, but I would say the most competitive out of all of the types that I do is probably the crane machines, actually, which is the the amusement mm -hmm. vending. Yep. Um, and part of the reason for that is because there's already a limited market. 
Um, so it's a, it's a niche, right? You really can only go in businesses where there's going to be kids. Because if I were to put a crane machine um, in an office building, nobody's probably going to play that crane machine. Right. Um, you know, th- this is something that's supposed to appeal to kids. So, so you're already limited by that. Um, and you know, these, these machines, they can, they can do pretty well. And because of that, um, there's a lot of competition. So, so yeah, I mean, for the other types of vending, um, the honor boxes, I would say has the least competition out of all of them. And that's why I would suggest that to someone who's just starting out to see if it's something they might like to do. Right. Um, because it's, it's actually a very, uh, fairly old business, the honor boxes, but it's, uh, kind of, it's actually starting to come back now, um, in a, in a lot of places, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it pretty much went down to almost zero and there's only a few like really large honor box businesses that I know of in the country. Um, so, you know, chances are like in your local area, you could easily start this business, you know, buy the boxes, buy the snacks, and then just go around and, and try it out and see, you know, if the locations are doing good. Um, so I would say that has the least competition. Um, you know, the, the only drawback with the honor boxes is probably the fact that it is honor system. Um, you know, you, you do have to worry about theft. A lot of times it will start out really good. But then someone figures out that they can steal, or or maybe they stop um, they stop paying for the snacks, and at that point it goes downhill. So then you're left thinking, well, this location was doing really well, but now you know it's not making any money. Right. Um, and at that point, a lot of times you have to let go, which is hard because you were <laughs> making money earlier, but right. you just have to let go. Yeah. Yeah. So great insight. So yeah, there's there's definite um, pros and cons to each business, but, yeah. but I would say as far as competition, um, you know, honor boxes would be great to get started with. And then if you wanted to go a little bit more serious, you could take some of those honor box locations and you could convert them to machines or, you know, other types of different locations. Great advice. Great advice. So, um, in, a, in addition to starting a route from scratch, like you did, there is also the mm-hmm. option out there to buy an existing vending route or even partner with a with a franchise to get started. You chose to do do it from scratch. Um, are you happy that you did? And what are your thoughts on people buying existing routes? Yeah, I, I really am happy that I did. Um, I, you know, I'll start out by discussing why I might want to. Um, and I I would think if if I was getting into a franchise with vending. It would be probably one of the same reasons I would get into a franchise with any other type of business, which which means I would want something established already. Like yep. they maybe they have a marketing budget or maybe they have a brand name, um, but something that is already drawing people to me uh, without me having to do anything. And of course, there's going to be in, in any kind of business that you're going to get into, you're going to have to do some marketing yourself. Um, but if you're going to pay someone else a franchise, you want them to bring something to the table, um, you know, especially in something like vending, where you can really learn this process yourself. Yep. Um, I don't know if there's really a, a secret sauce. You can get the locations yourself. Um, I would say the only reason I would get into a vending franchise is if you're going to already have like some customers. Maybe they have like a existing relationship with you know, Walmart or something like that. And then you're going to be putting your machines in Walmart. Um, in that case, you know, you may want to think about if that's, if that's worth the franchise fee that you're going to pay them. But otherwise, you know, you can learn how to do a lot of this stuff yourself. Um, it's not rocket science and you just have to learn as you go. So for me, I thought, you know, versus buying a franchise, um, I guess the other option would be paying somebody. Uh, for their locations, maybe paying some another company that's local that wants to sell their locations. Mm-hmm. Um, that probably scares me even more than buying a franchise, <laughs> right. be- because you know vending is a a cash business a lot of times. Yep. And so you have no way of verifying for that individual location uh, what it's actually worth, because right. even if you could look at their tax returns, um, you know, you might be able to do that for if you're buying an entire business. 
and then you might get a good sense of you know the money that it's making but there would be no way of knowing um, for an individual location that you're buying how much money it's actually bringing in until you um, buy the location and then you know they give you the keys but did they give you all of the keys Um, they they might be keeping a key for themselves so Mm -hmm. I mean, you you really have no way of knowing, um, and and there are lots of uh, business opportunities out there in vending, where basically they'll sell you a machine. Um, it will be way 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 overpriced. Um, you can buy these machines yourself, either used or new. A lot of times you can buy them used, and they're just as good, if not better, hmm. than a lot of the new machines, uh, because the the used machines are are the brands that just tend to last for a really long time. And there's a lot of companies that make new machines that won't last for a year. But if you buy a good used machine, um, it's already been used for 10 years and it'll probably last another 20 years. Um, so yeah, I mean, you just have to be very careful about any, any business opportunity where they're selling locations. Um, you know, they might charge you a few hundred dollars for each location. Uh, or maybe even like a thousand dollars, you know, depending on the type of location. Um, it's generally not worth it because you'll end up getting locations that most of them will be worthless. Um, so, so yeah, I just I just did it myself, and you know that that helps me learn the business because, like I said earlier, the key to the business is really locating. Um, so as far as someone good for this business, um, you have to make sure that you're you have a bit of a sales mentality and you shouldn't be afraid of rejection because you're going to have to go around and, you know, you'll, you'll definitely get a lot of no's, but you know, you'll get better and better at it. And um, the more I would say uh, better known you get in your community, you can say, Oh, well, you know, um, this business down the street, you know, also has a machine. So they know that of that business. And, you know, I, I go to businesses now where, you know, they've seen my machines before, so they know them in the area. Um, So that makes it more likely for me to be able to place something there. Yeah. Yeah. Like any other business, uh, it takes time, initiative, momentum, motivation to build it. And uh, that's a great point. You know, the the type of personality, their proclivities, what what they like to do, what they hate to do. Uh, Obviously, sales and relationship building, community networking, all those things, highly important. Is there anything else, any other type of skills or maybe a personality type that you think does better in vending? I think like any entrepreneurial business, you really you need at least one person who is competent at everything. You're never going to be an expert at everything, Mm -hmm. Um, but you definitely need someone who's competent at everything. And I'll give you an example. So I'm I'm probably not the most outgoing person, but I forced myself to go out there and go to those locations. And now, you know, a few years later, it's easy for me to do that. Yeah. Um, at first, it was definitely strange going in a business. You have no business being there at all. Uh, a lot of times, a lot of times they're not happy for you to be there. Yep. And you just have to explain why you're there. And you have to be able to make a good impression very quickly. Um, so that's the part of the business that I had to learn. But um, I would say like the other parts of the business that, and, and this goes for a lot of different kinds of businesses, um, you definitely have to be good at some kind of finance or, or get someone who is mm-hmm. because you need to know if you're making money or not. And I'm actually um, a trained accountant, but even still I had problems um, at first understanding whether each one of my locations were making money right. because I wasn't really considering things like labor, like the the time it takes you to uh, prepare everything to service these different machines is worth money. Yep. So you, you have to allocate that to, to each of your locations and make sure that you're still making money after gas, after labor, um, if you have any employees, and, you know, after any other cost, and you have to factor all of that in. And then after that, that's the amount of profit that you made. Um, so I would say that's that's a skill. Um, other than that, I would say those are the, the two main ones. Uh, you know, I would say you have to you have to know how to leverage yourself properly if you want to expand. Like the rule that I generally have is I don't ever want to spend more money than I'm making. 
Um, so I want to try to make that money and profit first before I, I start spending it. But, you know, if, if you expand to a certain point, you probably will want to take on, you know, investors or um, get some kind of a loan in order to expand further. But I would only do that if you have a very good reason to believe that you're going to make money from that investment. And that generally means you need to have already done it a little bit first. Right. So if you have your process figured out, then you can say, okay, well, if I spend more money on this exact same process, it's going to increase. Um, and you have to make sure that when you do that, that this is a business that can scale because some businesses, you know, they're never going to be able to scale. Um, so yeah. you just have to make sure you have all your ducks in a row. And then once you have that, then you can think about, you know, investing a little more in scaling. Yeah, makes sense. And a lot of people, I think, underestimate the level of difficulty in actually going out and cold contacting a company, either by phone or whatever. And right, it's not easy, especially the you know the first call, the second call, and that's why people end up with ten vending machines in their garage, right? But it, exactly. it's not easy. Yeah. Right? But yeah, it's great when you know you reap the rewards down the line. You you made it happen, and uh, that's a good thing. Where do you see the uh, the future going for vending? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. I would say the future is going to be a lot more automated payments. Mm. Right now, you still have a lot of cash in vending, yep. um, but I make sure like all the machines that I have, they most definitely have card readers. Um, they're able to accept you know, the new forms of payment as well, like the, the chips and the cards. Um, and then the, probably on the horizon is you know, stuff like Bitcoin, um, you know, mobile payments with your phone. Yep. Um, so, you, you know, you may want to consider that one day. I would say right now it hasn't reached a critical mass unless you're in a very, you know, trendy area, maybe with a lot of young people. But in general, um, I would say as long as you're accepting cash and cards at the moment, you're going to be fine. And the good thing about a lot of these, um, a lot of the machines for vending is uh, they have a, a system where basically the machine communicates with the card reader um, and that, and the card reader could be anything. So um, it could be something that, you know, one day it accepts the mobile payments. So a lot of these machines will be able to, you know, you could still have a, a 20 year old machine that will be able to communicate with the, the card reader, which will be from another company. And it should still be able to accept those new forms of payment now, but that is something to consider. Like if you're going to do something, purely mechanical, like say the bulk vending, um, you know, a lot of those, they, they only accept quarters and, you know, one day, I don't know, inflation or something, um, you know, you, you're going to have to be careful because if I just think like my, my bulk vending business is going to be destroyed if inflation goes up and, you know, the cost of gumballs goes up and then I have to raise prices to, to 50 cents. I'm going to have to replace the entire, um, mechanism in the right. machine to do 50 cents instead of 25 cents. Mm -hmm. So it's not as simple as just raising your prices like with other types of vending. So yeah, you definitely have to future proof your business. <laughs> great point. That's a great point. Any uh, final tips for people who are starting out before we wrap up? Yeah, I would say just start small. Um, the great thing about vending is you can start with one location and don't be afraid if it's not working out. Um, even if you think it's not working out to relocate the machine, a lot of times you'll be glad you did. And, uh, yeah, I mean, once you, you know, you'll have a lot of bad locations, but then once you get to those, those good locations, that's really what makes it worth it because a lot of times those tend to be the nicer customers as well. And, you know, they really appreciate what you're doing for them. And, and that's kind of, you know, what makes it all worth it. So I would say, you know, just keep going until, you get that one good location and then you can determine whether this is something that, that you want to do because you may have to locate 10 to get to that one. But, you know, one day, you know, if you've done enough locating, you know, maybe you'll have a hundred good locations. So, and that's, and that's when it starts to get a little bit more automated. So, right. yeah, I would just say just keep going, keep, keep selling. And, uh, you know, eventually you'll get to where you want to be. Great. Fantastic information and really uh, appreciate you taking the time to share it with us today. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so much. Now, if any viewers are struggling with their vending goals, they need some help to get started. Ben is available as a consultant. He also has a downloadable kit that's available to help you build 
your vending empire. If you visit his website, you can download his free top 10 mistakes that vendors make. You can find Ben's site at www.vendadvice.com. We'll post a link down below in the description box as well. Please like and subscribe to the Franchise City channel for lots more business tips in the future. And thank you very much for watching. You are listening to Franchise City, interviews with entrepreneurs.